How are you? Uh, so good morning, guys. Uh, this was very much spur of the moment, uh, uh, and, and and thanks in part to Ed's schedule and uh, um, you know kind of an unfortunate family situation that we're both dealing with, but you know some good is coming out of it. Uh, in that uh, you guys are so super fortunate to uh, get to talk to one of, I think, the most interesting people that I've ever met, and literally one of the first people that I've ever met. That's true. <laughs> so, uh, probably Second like part top is three. True. Within the top three, yeah. maybe yeah. two, yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know about that. So, um, so my brother Ed is um, a local, just like me, graduated from Ford in uh, 1987, went to U of M, and then, um, then right after college did well enough uh, to not have to figure out what he was going to do with his life and actually kind of knew what he was going to do with his life right away. They've heard a little bit of my college story. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So uh, like he, he left U of M in the way you're supposed to after two years with job prospects. Um, so um, at, uh, after college, you went to New Jersey and got a job, and the job helped him out with some grad school stuff where he went to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And I know I've got a couple of you, I think, that are looking at Carnegie Mellon, possibly. Um, and um, got immediately into the security world and, and was like literally one of the guys that was building the ground floor, I, I think it's safe to say, of like the modern cybersecurity uh, community. Uh, to this point uh, in his career, he's, um, he's training, teaching uh, literally thousands o over your career yeah. of security professionals that are, are trying to keep um, you guys safe, your identity safe, our, our finance is safe, and then in recent years, you've gotten more involved in keeping our, our nation safe and, and help safe. training the people that are making sure other foreign countries that might want to bring us harm. Good this morning, entire building. This is Mrs. Yoko from 240. If you accidentally took laptop cart number six, if you could return it to my room, I haven't checked out this morning. Thank you. You did it, didn't so, you? <laughs> for once, I did not take life card number six. Uh, but don't ask about five. Um, so uh, he's now working on, on training uh, security professionals that are for our nation, within, within the Army, within the National Security uh, Administration Agency. 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 Um, so um, so where, where I've obviously been most connected with that is, is he's my brother. Uh, I've been looking up for uh, – I'm sorry, I'm getting a little misty right here. But I've been looking up to him for, for my entire life. And uh, – I didn't plan on doing this, but it's an emotional time. <laughs> it is, it um, is. And so in addition to like building literally thousands of, of security professionals keeping us safe, uh, he's been building an inferiority complex and younger siblings since <laughs> roughly the mid-1980s. And, and I'm super excited to have him here and, and talk to you guys. And, uh, and I uh, can't wait to hear this, 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 this talk. So oh, thank you. Thank you, my brother. Here. Right. Uh, oh. The Dobies are not. Oh. Hey. So good morning. good morning. How you guys doing? Good. Well, I, well, I'm super excited to be here. I just uh, I tweeted about it about a half hour ago. Just to yeah, <laughs> it's just it's at Ed Scotus. Just uh, E D S K O U D I S. Um, so yeah, Andy, thank you for for doing that wonderful introduction. So I'm a uh, I'm a hacker. That's what I do for a living. That's what I've done since I was in high school. Um, I hope you're not of the impression that you think hackers are are evil. What's that? Um, yes, I am. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> oh, God. You guys are hilarious. So, uh, so I started hacking maybe when I was 13 or 14 years old. Um, and, and hackers, I hope you're not under the impression that hackers are like evil or bad. Hacking is morally and ethically neutral. You can use hacking for good and you can use hacking for evil. I'm going to talk to you today about some uses of hacking for good. Um, and uh, if you have any questions or anything like that, we're going to do a big Q&A thing at the end uh, that can be about this technology I'm going to tell you about, or if you have questions about career stuff, or if you're thinking of maybe going to certain colleges or, or maybe going into the military or something like that, I'm happy to give you advice. If you want to become a professional hacker, let's talk, right? So, um, so we're going to have Q&A at the end, but also if you have questions while I'm going through this, stop me, raise your hand, that's totally cool, all right? So, as I said, uh, I'm a professional hacker. What that means is uh, we do penetration testing. Uh, companies, government agencies, and the military pay us to hack them so that they can see where they're weak and fix that before the real bad guys come, right? So we call it penetration testing because we're trying to penetrate into uh, their environment. So in addition to doing the penetration testing, I also uh, lead a team 
where we train people. Andy had mentioned this. Uh, we train people, and lately we've been training a lot of military personnel. I was thinking about this morning. I've probably trained over 15,000 people uh, in the art of hacking uh, to do it in an ethical and professional fashion. But something happened to me a few years ago that I'd like to share with you. Um, originally, I was going to put together a little movie um, that was based on Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Has anybody ever seen that? Oh, sh shame on you. <laughs> I'm so sad for you. No, it's a classic of Western civilization. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, you probably... It's a trilogy, yes. I, I haven't seen the second or third, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Is it downhill from the first? Okay, it's so like the Matrix. There's only one Matrix. Yeah, you got to see it. Oh, uh, okay, all right. So you see it just to say you can see it. All right, so Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Well, I was going to do a movie called Skoto and Josh by an Enigma. Um, but then something happened uh, on the way to buy an Enigma and on the way back. So uh, we changed the title of it to Please Keep Your Brain Juice Off My Enigma. How many people know what an Enigma machine is? Well, that's pretty cool. Oh, okay. For those of you that don't, don't worry. You'll figure it out. Okay. So what you're about to hear is a true story. Um, not only a true story from the 1940s, well, starting in the 30s and then into the 40s, and also... Uh, modern day stuff. Everything I'm about to say to you, absolutely true. Um, I'm going to give you a little history about one of the characters here, an Enigma machine, and uh, that's me and my buddy Josh Wright. Uh, we had an adventure where we went to buy an Enigma. Okay, so the Enigma machine was actually created in the 1930s by a guy named Sherbius. Um, Sherbius invented this thing because his idea was business people would want to use it. It's an encryption machine. What you would do is it looked kind of, it's, it's about this big, it weighs 26 pounds. It's actually quite heavy. It's in a wooden box. It has a keyboard with the alphabet on it. And the keyboard's a little bit different layout. It's a German layout of the keyboard. And you would type in a message. You'd, like, push down a key, and it would light up a different thing that that would encrypt to. And his thought was people are engaging in business transactions, like you're buying stocks or selling stocks, and you might not want other people to know what stocks you're buying, because maybe you're buying a little bit and you want to buy more over time, and if they see you're buying those stocks, they might start buying it, which will drive the price up, so it's going to cost you more. So his thought was, you're going to want to have secrecy and privacy in what you're doing when you're buying stocks. So he made these machines. Nobody bought them. Nobody was that interested in them. He was making them in the 1930s, and just in, in Germany, and it was going nowhere. His business was going bankrupt. And then the Nazis came into power. And the Nazis were building up their military because conquest it was their goal, right? And uh, they started buying these machines. They started buying a bunch of them. In fact, uh, the Enigma company couldn't make enough to satisfy the Nazis. So the Nazis started building additional factories to turn these things out. There were three factories making Enigma machines. Uh, by the end of the war, they had made 22,000 of them. There's about 300 that remain today. Okay, so uh, you set these little rotor things up on top. That's your encryption key. There's a little plug board on the bottom that's, that you plug all these different things in that swaps letters and such, and then you dial your stuff in. Um, you're familiar with, like, the, the simplest little cipher that you could have. It's called a Caesar cipher, where you just shift the letters, right, like, like maybe by five. What this is is it's a dynamically rotating Caesar cipher that just kind of keeps going, shifting the letters by multiple different variants every time you type in a keystroke. It is an impressive piece of encryption, especially for its era, the 1930s. All right, so during the war, it was used to encrypt all tactical communication uh, for the German military. Um, it wasn't used for, like, strategic high command stuff. You know, Hitler sending messages back and forth. That used a completely different cipher, but all tactical communications happen this way. So move these troops from here to there and, and so forth. They generated millions of Enigma encrypted messages. I mean, it was used for everything. And they, sometimes you'll see a movie uh, set in World War II times, and you'll see uh, you know, the German soldiers, and they're carrying this big wooden box around with them. That was their Enigma machine. And occasionally they'll open the box. For example, uh, anybody here see Das Boot? It's an old movie about German submarines. Yeah, yeah. There's an Enigma machine in there. Uh, there's also a movie that came out called Imitation Game. came out about three, four years ago. Did you see that one? Yeah. So that one's all about the Enigma machine and the guy who cracked it. What was his name? Alan, Alan Turing. Alan Turing is one of the biggest geniuses of all times. You know, I mean, 
people talk about Einstein. And look, Einstein had a pretty huge impact on our lives. But Turing might have had a bigger impact on our lives than Einstein. Um, Turing came up with the idea of a machine that could calculate anything. It's the anything. Babbage came up with a machine that could calculate, but it could do add, subtract, all that kind of stuff, you know, a long time ago. But Turing said we could create a really simple machine that can do arbitrary calculation. It can calculate anything you want that's calculable. That's pretty amazing. That's one big thing that he did. Another big thing that he did, he cracked the Enigma machine. And a court, well, it was initially cracked by the Poles. A lot of people don't know this. Polish mathematicians cracked the early Enigma machine. The first Enigma machine, the one that was used for business, was a simpler one than the Nazis used in the war. It was really simple, and a guy named Marian Rajewski got in there, and he figured out how to crack it. Uh, he was in Poland in 1939. He had all of his research about how to crack the Enigma machine. Now, this is not the ones that the, the Germans were going to use later. They added that plug board, the thing where I said it in front of it, where you can plug all these different character substitutions in. Anyway, it was September 1939. They had all this intelligence about how to crack the earlier form of the Enigma. Now, what happened in September of 1939? The invasion of Poland, invasion of Poland exactly. They snuck out this stuff the day before the invasion happened. And they took all this stuff about cracking the Enigma without the plug board, and they took it to Britain. And in Britain, they took it to a place called Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park is about an hour north of London. And the hope was that it was far enough from London so that if the Germans ever decided to bomb London, you think that might happen, um, that this would still be safe an hour north of London. And then a guy named Alan Turing was put in charge of taking the Polish research on cracking the Enigma without the plug board and adapting it to cracking the Enigma with the plug board. So Rajewski actually ended up uh, serving in the Polish army, uh, the resistance fighting off the Germans, and never knew that his research was used to crack the subsequent Enigma machine. He never knew that. Anyway, Alan Turing took care of the project while it was in the UK and figured out how to crack it with that plug board in front of it. That was pretty amazing and awesome. He, in, in, in the process, he invented the modern art of cryptanalysis. You know what cryptography is. You take a message and you encrypt it, right? Cryptanalysis is where you break the encryption. So he invented modern cryptanalysis. Pretty, pretty darn awesome. Now, he made a machine to do this. These machines, are, they're like this big, and they kind of grind through. It was mechanical cryptanalysis. It would grind through with these little rotor things that would turn, and there'd be dozens and dozens of them in there to try to figure out what the right key was, what's the right combination. But the Brits couldn't make enough of these encryption cracking machines. They called them bombs, B-O-M-B-E. They couldn't make enough bombs. So they reached out to the Americans. And there's a guy named Joseph Desch who worked for a little company you may have heard of, National Cash Register, and said, hey, can you guys start building more of these Enigma, or Enigma cracking machines? Because we can't build enough in the UK. So the Americans started to build these machines as well. And uh, there's all kinds of interesting stories. Uh, Alan Turing came to see the American bomb machines to see you know, if they were any good. And he said, these things are crap. They changed my design. These people are Neanderthals. There's no way this thing is ever going to work. And it worked just fine. It worked great. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And according to Winston Churchill, cracking the Enigma machine shortened World War II by two or three years. Winston Churchill knew a thing or two about World War II, right? It shortened the war by two or three years. Imagine if that war had continued into 1947, right? By July of 45, the United States had the atomic bomb. We ended up using it twice in August uh, 1945 on Japan. Um, some people say we probably wouldn't have used it on Germany. I disagree. I mean, this was war, and it could have gotten really bad. Thankfully, they cracked the Enigma machine because it shortened that war and saved millions of lives. It's incredible. And this was all a hack. They hacked the Enigma machine. Cool. All right, so Enigma cryptography. Here's some fancy words here. It's a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. What does that mean? It's, like I told you, the Caesar shot cipher, where you'll take every A and map it into, say, five letters later. Every B will be mapped into five letters later. Every C. It's just a dynamic set of those, okay, constantly rotating. Now, when we have cryptography, we always think about the key space. How many different possible encryption keys can there be? 
the higher the key space, generally speaking, the better the cryptography. Right? You might see that now we talk about key spaces in bits. So this 128-bit key or a 256-bit key. The more bits there are in the key, the harder it is to determine the key because there's just more different values. So how many potential keys could there be for the Enigma machine? Well, key space calculations vary because there's so much going on in the Enigma machine. But one pretty good estimate is 3 times 10 to the 114th power. Well, is that big? <laughs> yeah, it's a little excessive, yes. And this is for 1930s cryptography. Uh, 10 to the 114th power. Um, it is believed there's about 10 to the 100 protons in the universe. So this is 100 trillion times more than the number of protons there are. That's pretty amazing, right? Okay, so crack that. Awesome. Now, the way the Enigma would work is they'd have this, uh, this book. It's a code book that would tell you the key for each day. So the idea is it would tell you how you'd configure the rotors, how you put those in. It would tell you the initial position of the rotors. So as they, they roll around, it's just uh, they've got the ABCs on the rotors. And uh, you'd set the whole thing up, and they would send messages via radio telegraphy. It's a telegraph, and you'd send messages, da -da 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 -da, and it would go out via radio signals. What would happen is your receiver would get those radio signals, transcribe it into letters, put it into the Enigma machine, and then decrypt the message. So what the Brits and the Americans did is we had sensors throughout Europe, throughout the Atlantic, throughout North Africa, pulling in all these radio messages. And they had a whole bunch of people pulling the messages in and then doing the decryption operation by running those bomb machines. In fact, at Bletchley Park itself, there were 9,000 people working on Project Ultra. That's what they called it for cracking the Enigma machine. 9,000 people. But they weren't the only ones. There were 16,000 more people gathering all those messages. 25,000 people. This was a big, big, top secret operation. Cool. There were some flaws, though, in the Enigma. You see your encryption? The security of it is not entirely based on the key space. You could have a big key space, but there's something kind of broken or messed up inside your cryptography so that we can skip past a bunch of the key space. That would be a big flaw in your encryption. So here's some implementation flaws. First, there's only 26 keys. That's it. There's not even a space in the Enigma machine. What they would do is they would use an X for a space. So what does that mean? Think about this. Statistical analysis is one of the ways we often break cryptography. What is the most common character in the English language? E? E or A? E or A? You're, you're, you're wrong. You're right if you, I asked what's the most common letter. The most common letter is E. Wheel of Fortune knows that. The most common character is space. Most common character is space. And that's awesome. Because what does that mean? In your Enigma machine, when they encrypt the messages, the most common character you're going to see is X. So what you could do is you can kind of optimize things to try to crack it. If you see a bunch of X's start to pop out, or if you see a bunch of E's start to pop out, that's really, really good news. In fact, I went to Bletchley Park. Uh, a couple years ago, and when I got there, it was so cool. They treated me so nicely and, and showed me all the Enigma machines. They have 11 Enigma machines at Bletchley Park. I know it's kind of excessive, but why not? Um, they had this one really special Enigma machine that Alan Turing himself modified. What he did, it's so cool. It's an Enigma machine with, with the little light bulbs, but instead they replaced the light bulbs with little counters. So just a little counter. So every time the A light would light up, it would just count one. And then it light up again, too. And then they typed in messages because they were trying to do statistical analysis to see what the output of the Enigma machine would be. Is it truly making these things scrambled? Or are there patterns in the output that we might be able to pull apart? It's pretty awesome. A special mo Now, that's probably one of the most valuable Enigma machines ever, one that was custom modded by Alan Turing himself. Cool. Um, other things. The biggest flaw in the Enigma was the fact that no letter could ever encode to itself. An A can never encrypt to an A. A B can never encrypt to a B. Now, I remember I was talking to my wife about this, and she said, oh, that's good, because you think about it, right? If a letter could become itself, well, then it's not really encrypted, is it? It's really bad if a letter can never become itself. There should be some chance that a letter could, be, could become itself. And the reason is this. What they would do is they would start monitoring and pulling in all these radio signals from throughout Europe and North Africa. And they would take these signals and they would ship them to Bletchley Park so they could do their, uh, their, uh, their decryption process. 
Now, suppose you happen to know. You're a cryptanalyst, right? You're trying to break some cryptography. You happen to know some clear text. You happen to know some unencrypted stuff. Now, how might you know unencrypted stuff? Any thoughts? Where would you get that? You might have spies that would know some unencrypted stuff. What other words do you think they might use a lot? This is in the movie, too. Heil Hitler, right? Oh, the Germans said that all the time. If they didn't say that, people think maybe you're against the regime here, right? So Heil Hitler was another one. All kinds of clear text things. They call these things cribs. A crib is some clear text that you happen to know. Consider this crib. Mark Vert, X is a space, attacked. Now, obviously, being German, I translate it to English here to make sense. Now, how, how would you know that would be some clear text? Because maybe you're the Brits and you attacked Mark Vert, which is a base that they had, right? So you happen to know that there's going to be some message somewhere that's going to say Mark Vert was attacked. And then you start pulling in all these radio signals, and here is the ciphertext that you pulled in, and it looks like this. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to line these two up so that then you can use your bomb machine to try to figure out every possible setting for the Enigma machine to crack it. Now, could this fit here? Would this work? No. Do you see why? M can never encrypt to M, so we slide it. Could it fit here? No. C can never encrypt to C. You see how bad that is? If it can never encrypt to itself, I can slide it until, boom, it fits there. Then I'll take my bomb machine, and I'll encode all this stuff in, and it will tell me the precise settings of the rotors and plug board so that I can get the key. Now, you might say, wait a second. You already know the clear text. So what do you care about the key that was used to encrypt that message? Exactly it would be used to encrypt other messages. So once I've decrypted the one message that I already knew the decryption of, I can, I can now decrypt all the other messages using that same key. And there was this guy in Berlin. It was so awesome. Every morning, this guy in Berlin would wake up, look at the weather, and then encrypt the weather with the Enigma machine and transmit it out to all of the troops so they would know what the weather is for the day. So the Brits would fly a plane over Berlin, look at the weather, and now they know the clear text of the weather, and just wait for this guy to send his message. That's awesome. Thank you so much. There's all kinds of stuff that they would do with this. Um, there was one time that they decrypted an Enigma message, and the message was for this little encampment of German soldiers. Brits were all around them, and, they, and the Brits were thinking of attacking them. They sent a message, and the message was, nothing to report today. They cracked that message, and then British High Command says, you do not attack them. You stay away from them. Don't let them even see you. Because we want them to say, nothing to report today for as long as possible. But changing the key every single day. So for 14 straight days, this group of German soldiers transmitted the same message with a different key. And the Brits just stayed away. Let them keep sending that message. It's awesome. Really, really cool. Now, there's a couple other things that came up, though, with the Enigma machine. Um, the, the Allies decrypted pretty much every Enigma sent message. And Churchill had a big issue here because he knew exactly what the Germans were going to do, where their troop movements were, where all the submarines were, the whole thing. And they're send, the, the, the Americans are sending these, these big boats across the Atlantic, and we know exactly where their submarines are, and they were sinking a lot of our boats before we cracked the Enigma machine. Once we cracked the Enigma machine... Well, we could take our boats and kind of sail them so that they avoided all the submarines. But what's the problem with that? The Germans figure it out. Yes, the Germans would figure it out. And then, then they'd stop using the Enigma machine. We wanted them to keep using this crypto as long as possible. This was vital for us. So early on, Churchill said, send the boats where the boats would normally go. Don't have them go around. And a, a, a lot of people died because of that. That's a hard decision to make. Sending people to their death I mean, a fiery death with drowning involved, too? Um, bad news. But then later, they came up with this idea. Hey, what if, what if we would spot the submarines? So that's how we know where they're all at. So what they would do, submarines, you, you think submarines. I mean, literally, the word means under the water. But your actual submarines, most of the time, are above the water. They're, they're, they're essentially just ships that kind of sail on the water, and then they go under when they need to be sneaky or when they're about to attack. But most of the time, they're up there. They're just kind of sailing around. So what the Brits would do is they would send planes to go and spot the submarines. So the submarine's up, 
and the, you know, the, 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 the commander of the subs on, on deck, kind of looking around, oh, there's one of those British planes. We've been spotted. So they would actually send an Enigma encrypted message, hey, we've been spotted. And of course, we could decrypt that message. So once we, so the Brits, of course, knew where to send the planes because they knew where the subs were. And, and these sub commanders were like, the Brits must have so many planes because every time we surface, one of those damn things is up there and it spots us. So they just assume that the Brits had planes all over the place. And they're so good at spotting us. What kind of food is good for your eyes? Carrots. It's a lie. It's a lie created by the Brits because in addition to the, the planes, you know, they'd fly up and then this submarine would be very far away and the plane would go right up to it. How are those British airmen so good at seeing these submarines? They spread the lie purposely. It's because of the British diet. They eat so many carrots. So that came out of World War II that carrots are good for your eyes. They're not. They're not bad for your eyes either. It doesn't really matter. But it came out of the Enigma machine spotting the submarines. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Also to cover up the fact that the British had radar. Yeah, and the British did have radar too. So these, these were two things that, uh, that kind of came together. Absolutely. All right, so pretty cool. Oh, and later, so these are cribs. That's where you know the clear text. And later they started doing certain things to the Germans that would make them send certain messages with certain clear text, like attacking this place. They call that gardening because they're essentially planting clear text messages in. Awesome. So here's one of the bomb machines. This is an American-made bomb machine. And you can see it's got all these different rotors in it that just, and when you hear it, it makes a sound as it's trying to crack this. Uh, pretty amazing, amazing. So there was collaboration between the Americans and the Brits in gathering the messages, cracking the messages. It wasn't always super friendly. I mean, I already told you that, uh, that Turing called the Americans working on this stuff Neanderthals. Um, but that's kind of how Turing rolled, right? Brilliant guy, but uh, sometimes not super friendly. By the way, many of you said you'd seen the movie. There's some hi historical inaccuracies in the movie. In the movie... Turing comes across as very aloof, not very social, kind of mean and weird. Now, he was weird, and he was kind of mean, but when he wanted to turn on the charm, man, he could like, he was so charismatic when he wanted to be. They don't show that in the movie. He often didn't want to be very charismatic, but when he wanted to be, he could be. All right, so, oh, other things. It was not publicly acknowledged that the Brits and the Americans had cracked the Enigma machine until 1974. So think about it. I mean, we cracked it in the 1940s. Why do you think we kept that secret for so long? In case they use it again? That's actually pretty interesting. They did, and both of your answers are right. Your answer is right in the short term. Whoever said Cold War is right in the longer term. So in the shorter term, here's what happened. The war came to an end, and there were these boxes, 26-pound boxes, 22,000 of the darn things. So the Americans came in, we grabbed as many as we could, and we smashed them. That's what we did. We're very good at that. We smashed stuff, right? Um, the Brits came in and they said, wait a second. We're going to take these Enigma machines and let's ship them into East Germany. Because, you know, the Soviets are occupying that, hoping that they'll continue to use them. And we'll take some others and we'll send them to our, um, our colonies. Send some down to India, send some to Hong Kong, and have them use those. Because they're good enough cryptography because only the Brits and the Americans can crack it. So we wanted adversaries or other people under our control to use this stuff so we could see what they're still saying. So for short term, they continued to do that. For longer term, it didn't come out until 1974 that we had cracked it because we didn't want the Soviet Union to know what we were capable of in the 1940s because then they could project that forward. You never want your adversary to know your capabilities when it comes to cracking encryption because if they're going to use weak encryption, you want them to keep using weak encryption. So it didn't come out until 1974. So heroic mathematicians, soldiers, and sailors who lost their lives. Early on in the war, before we had cracked the machine, People would go and try to get those code books, the, the, the books with all the, the key information in it, and a lot of people died trying to get those code books. But then once we were able to crack the ending of the machine, man, things were much better. Also, other interesting stories. In the UK, the men were off fighting. So the women primarily worked at Bletchley Park. And they also had these women that they didn't want to tell them what they were actually working on. Um, but they would have to make the, the rotors to go into the bomb machines. And uh, it's very complex wiring inside there. And these women would come in every day and have to just wire these things up. And 
there were 26 different wires connecting 26 different contacts. And they didn't tell them what it was, but they knew. The women knew that this is somehow associated with encryption and we're helping the war effort to decrypt this stuff. So the, the role of women here was massive in the operations of cracking the Enigma machine. It was huge. Um, and the cryptographic attacks in the Enigma machine are still the same things we do today. Today, though, we do it with you know, automated computer systems. So that's the idea of the Enigma machine. Are there any questions on the Enigma before I move on to the next phase of our story? All right. So given that history, wouldn't it be cool to have an Enigma machine? You know, I mean, there's about 300 left in the world. So let's get one. That would be neat. Every five years or so, one comes up for sale on eBay or they go up for auction at like Sotheby's and stuff like that. Um, you could buy parts. You could buy rotors from Enigma machines. You could buy plugs from the plug board and such. But it'd be really cool to get a whole Enigma machine. So in March of 2011, I toured the National Cryptologic Museum. This museum is right outside of the NSA, uh, which is in Fort Meade. It's in Maryland. And I toured the museum, and I originally thought, I don't, no offense to my brother here, but I get bored in museums myself sometimes. I can, I can usually handle a museum for two or three hours, and then I'm like, what's for lunch, right? Um, I don't think Andy's like that. No, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, like that. yeah, two or three hours. Anyway, I went to this museum. Holy cow, it's a tiny museum. It's about, it's smaller than this room, okay, the entire museum. Um, they have seven Enigma machines there. So Bletchley's got 11. The American Museum equivalent, we, we only have seven. Uh, but we've got a couple of bomb machines there, too, which is pretty cool. Um, anyway, I spent the entire day there, and I wanted more. There's just so much fascinating stuff there. So I asked the curator, hey, you know, these Enigma machines that go up for auction are so darn expensive. I'd like to just have a replica. Is there somebody that could make me a replica Enigma machine just to have? That'd be kind of neat. And he hooked me up with a guy named Jim Orem, who was working on making a replica Enigma machine. And Jim spent about a decade working on the darn thing, didn't have it quite finished. I emailed him. He said, I'm trying to build one for myself. I can't build one for you, too. So getting a replica Enigma just was not going to happen. But then a guy who worked for me, his name is Yori Kavichko. And Yori was teaching a class on hacking that I had written. And he was teaching the class in Canada. And he mentioned how his crazy boss, me, wants to get an Enigma machine. And a guy in the class raised his hand and said, I know of someone who's selling an Enigma machine. Is your boss really interested? So right in the middle of class, Yori picks up the phone, calls me, and says, hey, Ed, I got a student in my class here who knows somebody selling an Enigma machine. Are you still interested? So I said, of course, yes. He hooked me up, and I contacted a guy named Dr. David. That's just his first name. He asked me to not put his last name in here. Dr. David saying, hey, I hear you have an Enigma machine to sell. <laughs> so... Should I just wait that out? Or? All right. So you have an Enigma machine to sell. And he says, yes, I'm actually the broker, though. There's another guy named Dr. Tom who is selling the Enigma machine. So Dr. David and Dr. Tom and I kind of all got together, and the plan was I was going to buy an actual Enigma machine, not a replica, in mid-July of 2011. I learned a lot about Dr. Tom during this. He's a very interesting guy. He's a retired college professor from an Ivy League school. Uh, he wrote a book about Enigma machines, and they gave me a free copy. Um, but he's a really interesting character. So July 2011, I'm going to buy myself an Enigma machine. But then my wife got sick. She got uh, tongue cancer. Um, it was pretty nasty stuff. Uh, on June, so this is just like a week or two before I was going to buy the Enigma machine, doctors at, at Sloan Kettering in New York City said that she's going to need uh, surgery. They, they had to take out part of her tongue. Uh, chemo radiation, um, it was going to be bad stuff. So I emailed the guy saying, look, I don't know what's going to happen financially to me. I can't buy an Enigma machine right now. i got to take care of my wife. Um, so they were very gracious about the whole thing. They told me I could keep the book they gave me about the Enigma machine, and, uh, and it was just off. We, we, we couldn't do it. So it was a tough year, uh, the last half of 2011, the first half of 2012. Um, but she turned the corner. Modern medicine is incredible. It's amazing. I mean, it is hard to get cancer treatment, but it so often works today. It's really an incredible thing. I'm so thankful. She's doing great now. She's like the epitome of health. She's just awesome. Awesome. So by July of 2012, I'm like, my wife, Josephine's her name, Joe. She's, she's getting better. So I reach out to Dr. David and Dr. Tom, and I say, long time no speak. It's been a year. Do you have any Enigmas for sale still? Turns out they did. Four Enigma machines to choose from. 
How does this guy get these Enigma machines? Here's how he does it. He doesn't steal them. Although at Bletchley Park, somebody did steal one of the Enigma machines. They had 11? Well, they had 10 for a little while because somebody got in and stole one. Now, when you steal an Enigma machine, you, if, if you want to monetize it, you've got a problem. How the heck can you sell that without getting noticed, right? So it didn't work out so well for him, okay? Uh, they, they apprehended him and the Enigma went back. But the way this works is, remember I told you how at the end of the war, they shipped some into East Germany with a hope that the East Germans would continue to use them. And they did. The secret police, the Stasi, the East German secret police, continued to use the Enigma machines for about 10 years after the war. This is awesome for us because we can decrypt that stuff. But also, once these machines started to break down, or once they finally retired them, what would happen is, you know, some East German secret police guy who used the Enigma machine, he'd say, what do I do with this old box? And they're like, that's old crap from the war. That's Nazi stuff. Throw it away. Or just take it home. We don't care. So what Dr. Tom does is he reads the obituaries from the area that used to be East Germany. And he's looking for people in their 90s who have recently died that used to work for the East German secret police. And if he finds an obituary where somebody died like that, he calls the family on the phone and says, I'm so sorry for your loss, but Grandpa may have left something in the attic. I need you to go into the attic and look for something like this. And he finds one or two or three a year using this mechanism. He goes in there, finds it, buys it from the family, but now he's got a bit of a problem. In Germany, it is illegal to buy or sell any Nazi paraphernalia. You're not allowed to do it. This is part of the post-war denazification of Germany. So he sneaks them out of the country. <laughs> after he, and The family's taken care of. That's all good. But he sneaks them out of the country and then flies them back to the U.S. and sells them to collectors like me. All right. Ah, there you go. Bingo. Oh, and so, so he's got these four Enigma machines, and I look at them, and, you know, some of them are kind of beaten up. Some of them are kind of nice. There's this one, though, that's pristine. A726. That's the serial number. 726. It was the lowest serial number I'd ever seen in an Enigma machine. Lower serial numbers mean they're earlier models. Uh, since then, I have seen A610, but A726 is the lowest that I had seen at that time. Uh, uh, even Bletchley, their, their lowest serial number is in the 800s. Right? So, all right, so, but this best Enigma machine that, I, that he's got, the Brazilians wanted to buy for him for one of their museums. Why would Brazil want to have an Enigma machine? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> Uncle Andy? Not You're not there yet? Okay, so the war ended, and you got all these Nazis, and they're like, there's going to be war trials. This is going to suck, right? Nuremberg, all that jazz. Let's go somewhere else. And many of the Nazis fled and went to Brazil and Argentina. And this is their grandchildren wanting to have a little piece of that history. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Oh, boy. All right. And then there's this whole idea, is it just too crazy to buy an Enigma machine? Okay. But the best one was this one that was promised to a Brazilian uh, a museum. So I got to know Dr. Tom a lot better. He's a fascinating gentleman. Um, he's interested in education theory. How can you get ideas into the heads of, of people to train them up? Um, technology, history, he has a quirky sense of fun. He's weird. He's a weird dude. He sent me his Christmas cards. And here's his Christmas cards. Look at this guy. Here he is in a tuxedo with one, two, three, four, five Enigma machines, a couple extra rotors, a little Santa Claus on the thing. That's his Christmas card. Next year, look at the Christmas card here. He's in a, a meadow full of snow dressed as... This dude's weird. Oh, Merry Christmas. All right. But who am I to talk? These are my Christmas cards um, over here. There's a kind of scan you can do of a computer system called a Christmas tree scan. So my Christmas card had a Christmas tree scan there. And over here, this is another year Christmas card. Um, what I had done is I had mapped uh, all the computers that are in sort of the top part of the northern hemisphere. And I looked up geographically which one is the northernmost computer on planet Earth that I could access on the Internet. Because I figured that had to be Santa's computer right at the North Pole. And then I sent a message to that computer, just, just sent some packets up there saying, Merry Christmas, Santa. And what I did is I ran a tool to grab those packets on their way to the North Pole and display it. So this is me saying Merry Christmas to Santa. I figured that's a good Christmas card, right? I don't know. All right. So we finalized the deal. It was set. 
Oh, by the way, I had to drive up to his farmhouse, which is on top of a mountain. Dr. Tom lives on top of a mountain at a farmhouse to do the Enigma deal. It was a seven-hour drive for me. It was a four-hour drive for my friend Josh. I asked Josh to come with me because I wanted to share this. You know, how often in your life do you buy an Enigma machine, right? One time I wanted to share it with a good friend, so Josh came with me. Uh, the plan was Dr. Tom would serve a delightful lunch, show us the machines. I would get to choose which one of the four. He talked to the Brazilians. They would relinquish their request for A726 and buy another one if I wanted A726. A726 was his more expensive one. So what I did is I brought two checks. One was for the less expensive one, and the other check was for the delta, the, the, the difference, so I could get the more expensive one just by handing him both checks, but I didn't know for sure. We set the date, August 16th, 2012. Oh, and he threw in some extras for me. You know, when you buy an English machine, he's being nice. He threw in some telegraph keys that they would use to transmit the messages and all that kind of stuff, books, etc. But a couple days before, it was three days before, I went up to do the transaction, A couple days before I did the transaction, I got an email from Dr. Tom. Here's what the email said. He was a professor of physiology at an Ivy League school, specifically focused on neuroscience, specifically the brain and spinal cord. Here's what he wrote to me. I'm going to read it to you because it's important. But in thinking outside the box about other things that might light up your secret room, I have a secret room in my office. It's really kind of cool. So my office is all done in a steampunk style you know, steampunk, and you go into my office, and then there's this bookcase that if you pull on it, it opens like French doors, and you can go inside the secret room, okay? Um, anyway, but in thinking outside the box about other things that might light up your secret room, I came across the idea of your having and showing off the earliest and most complex computer system ever designed, one that even Alan Turing admired. This is a sales guy here, right? He's trying to hook me on the sale. A system the CIA and NSA and military are constantly trying to develop better techniques to hack into, and a system that defies complete understanding to this day. What is it? This is what he wrote in his email. And then in the email, he had enter, 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 enter. So he had to scroll down to see what it was. Can you imagine what it was that this man wanted to sell me? A brain. He said that as a professor, he got access to certain specimens, and he kept a couple. And he had a few spare human brains and wanted to sell one to me. Yeah. This is haha, interesting question. I think that's illegal. I called my lawyer after this happened. I said, hey, uh, my lawyer's Mark Rash. Hey, Mark, um, I just want to make sure I didn't do anything wrong. He's like, well, what happened? Well, a guy offered to sell me a human brain. And he's like, did you buy it? I said, no. He said, oh, okay, then you're fine. <laughs> yeah. I had to pay my lawyer for that little bit of advice there. Anyway, so this is Dr. Tom. This is actually the man himself with a model of a brain, okay? But he had a couple of real brains that he wanted to sell me, at least one. One for the secret room. He said you could put it in a nice little jar and such in the secret room. Okay, my reaction. Um... Man, I'm bringing Josh with me because I don't want to drive up to this guy who's selling human brains by myself. I can run faster than Josh. I mean, this is, Josh was a strategic decision for me. I'm going to bring somebody who's a very dear friend, but that I can run faster, okay? I told him, and this wording here is really important, it would kind of creep me out to have a brain in the secret room. I have a suit of armor in my office, and it took me a couple of weeks to get used to that being a piece of furniture because when you see like a human figure, even a suit of armor that's not moving, your brain says there's a human there. It's just, and it's kind, of, and it's watching me and it's sitting there. But now my brain just kind of understood that thing is a piece of furniture. But to actually have a real human brain in the secret room would creep me out. It would creep me out to have a brain in the secret room next to me. It took me three weeks to get used to that suit of armor. I said I do like the idea though, so maybe I'll get a fake brain, put it in a jar or something like that. But a real brain, no, no, no dice. All right, so we're, it's Enigma buying day. And Josh and I had a big debate about what do you wear when you buy an Enigma machine. You want to do this right, right? So I had an Enigma t-shirt that a, that a friend of mine gave me, and I thought, well, maybe I should wear that, right? And Josh is like, dude, um, if you want to convey any impression that you could walk away from the sale, I think you should leave the Enigma shirt at home. I did wear the Enigma shirt, but I wore it underneath another shirt. So <laughs> Josh had an Alan Turing shirt, too. So, so it's the day to buy the Enigma. I get up at 5 a.m. and I start driving. Driving north. Josh leaves at 8 a.m. And man, when I'm driving up there, it's weird. There's a house in a ditch. Here's a really friendly looking country store. 
No way. Look at that. This is like where people go and they never come out. Right? There's no windows or anything. And here's another house where there's like garbage coming. And I'm driving and driving. It's getting creepier and creepier. There is no cell phone service within about 25 minutes of this guy's house. So you just like, you go off the grid. It's crazy. It's a red flag. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my. Oh, and then he says, there's a bridge that's washed out, and they put a temporary bridge over it, and there'll be a tree right before that that'll have a sign that's painted in red. It's a blood red sign uh, with my road name. I blurred it out here because I didn't want you to see that. And what you do is stop before you get to the uh, washed out bridge, turn right, drive up my driveway, which goes up to the top of the mountain, and I'll be there with my wife, Gretchen, to greet you. Okay, great. <laughs> So we get to this nice farmhouse. They're there at the top. Hey, the boys are here to buy the Enigma machine. They're waving to us. They're very sweet and nice. He takes us on a tour. Here's A726, but he had some other stuff. Look, he's trying to sell me all this stuff. He's retired, right? He's looking for a source of income. And here's crazy Ed Scotus wanting to buy an Enigma machine. So there's my buddy Josh. There's the Enigma machine. Um, we tested it. I had an iPad app that implemented an Enigma machine, and we encrypted the message with the iPad and then decrypted it with A726. And I even said to Josh, you know, beforehand, that box looked like an Enigma machine to me, but after I decrypted a message with it, it was an Enigma machine to me. You see? And then Josh pointed out how ironic it was. We used a simulation of an Enigma machine to test the reality of a real Enigma machine. It's kind of weird, right? Yeah. So I used the iPad, and I encrypted Josh X right. It decodes perfectly, and it's awesome. Cool. We have a truly delightful lunch. Um, uh, some fresh gazpacho soup that Gretchen had made from, from tomatoes in their garden. Just really, really nice. An Enigma mug. He let us keep the mug, by the way, which is kind of nice, too. And, and they served the lunch on these really nice china plates. Those plates will become important in just a little bit. Okay. Nice china plates. So Josh and I go for a walk. Do we get A2200 or A726? And, and we're debating and we're debating. Uh, you know, we walk outside the house and, and uh, Josh said, look, you got the money. Why don't you just get the best one? I mean, because you always wonder what would happen if I hadn't gotten the best one. I'm like, okay, I'll get it. I'll get it. A726 it's going to be. And then I say to Josh, do you think we should ask him to see the brain? <laughs> and Josh is like, well, you're not going to buy it, right? I'm, no, no, I don't want to buy it, but I just want to, I want to see it. <laughs> yeah, call Mark again. I just want to see the brain. Um, Josh said, no, no, we don't want to ask him that. And I say, if we don't ask him to see the brain, we'll always wonder what would have happened if we'd asked him to see the brain. So Josh is like, well, all right, you're going to ask him to see the brain. So we go back in and we seal the deal. I give him the check. He gives me the angle machine. We shake hands. Everything's great. This is, this is fantastic. Right? And then I say, um, Dr. Tom, I mean... I don't want to buy the brain, but we would like to just see it. And then Dr. Tom says, I thought you said it would creep you out. And I'm like, yeah, it probably will, but we figured we should ask you to see it just, just because we want to see what it looks like. So he gets this big smile on his face. He's like, okay, I'm going to show you the brain. He puts on these big yellow gloves, goes into his kitchen, reaches into a bucket, and lifts out a brain. Yep. And then he says, Gretchen, Gretchen, give me a plate. I've got to show the boys the brain. So Dr. Tom takes the brain, smack, it slaps onto the plate. And I, I'm looking over this, and I'm like, that's a really nice plate. And Josh says, that's the plate we just ate lunch on. Can you believe it? Yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. All right. So then Dr. Tom says, oh, Ed, we got to get a photo of you and me, and your Enigma machine, and the brain. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we do. Uh huh. So he says, Gretchen, Gretchen, go get the camera, go get the camera. And we take this picture. So I'm like, sitting, this is the most bizarre thing that's ever happened in my life. He's all excited. Here's the brain. There's my Enigma. And then he's like, I don't think they can see the brain very well. So he starts tilting the plate forward. He's like tilting it forward, and it starts dripping, and it drips on the Enigma machine right here and then over on the side. So what do you do? I, mean, I just bought this thing. So I'm like, dude, you're like dripping brain juice on my Enigma machine. And Dr. Tom's like, it's no big deal. Gretchen even says, that Enigma's been through World War II. A little bit of liquid's not going to hurt it. And then the brain starts leaking on the table. 
So it's getting the liquid now on the table. Gretchen now gets really upset. She says, oh, wait, wait, that's my best table. Now this is serious. So she wipes up the table. This was bizarre, weird, most surreal thing I've ever experienced in my life. So conclusions. The Enigma machine is a symbol of how you can use hacking to actually make the world a better place and save lives. That's what Alan Turing did, right? So brilliant people work super hard to discover and exploit the security flaws of the Enigma machine with the goal of defeating the burgeoning Nazi empire. That's like the, the best hack of all time. And in our work as information security professionals, that's what I am, that's what maybe some of you will become, that's a goal we should all aspire to, to use our capabilities, our knowledge to defend good and to fight evil, right? And life is a strange adventure. Notice that throughout that whole story that I just told you, there were always these decisions. Should we do this or not do that? And many times the decisions were made is were based on, I want to know what would happen. I want to have that experience. Live boldly. You guys are at a point in your lives where so many amazing doors are open for you. Don't be timid. Don't be reckless. Don't be stupid. Calculate, but live boldly. It's an amazing world. Now, I put together a little video. It's only a one-minute video, but it's a movie trailer for the movie that's never been made of Josh and me going to buy an Enigma, and I'd like to share that with you. All right, let me go full screen here. Okay, here we go. That was my drive up. That's his driveway. There's Josh. Are there, thanks. <laughs> so, are, are there any questions <laughs> about the, in yes, sir. That's right. Oh, that's a great question. So, if I, uh, if I forget to repeat a question, just remind me. But the question is, I train people in cybersecurity, hacking, and that kind of stuff. What age range do I train? A wide variety of ages. Most of my focus is on training professionals. So they're usually maybe 23, 24, up to 60 years old. That said, I do um, some high school classes and consulting and even some junior high stuff. But that's not often. It's a few times a year. But my main focus is people that are you know, 23, 24, up to 60 or so. Other questions? Yes. Well, let's go with this one first, and then we'll get back to you. Yes, sir. So if... Um the Germans would decrypt the messages using an Enigma machine. Why didn't the Allies just try to steal an Enigma machine? We did. So the question is, if you could decrypt the message using an Enigma machine, why didn't we just use an Enigma machine to decrypt it? We did, but you still need the key. So the purpose of these bombs was to get the key. And then once you got that, you could use the Enigma machine to decrypt it. The, the purpose of the bomb was to go through hundreds of thousands or millions of possible keys so you could figure out what the right key was. Once you got that, then we'd use a, our own Enigma machines, ones that we had stolen or ones that we actually had fabricated. We built our own Enigma machines, too. Um, but early on in the war, we had to steal them, and that was really important. Um, there was actually, though, there's this wonderful story. They shipped one through France. Some, some, the Germans just shipped an Enigma machine, you know, through, like, the postage service through France, and we grabbed that one. So we kind of just got it from shipping. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yes? Um, yeah. like, what do you do now? Do you travel with your work? Um, how does that all work? Oh, I, I travel a fair amount. I travel less than I used to. I used to travel a lot, um, maybe 75, 80% of my time would be on the road. Now it's down to about 50% of my time. Um, in this, 
in the information security space, uh, especially penetration testing, when you're hacking people, there's a lot of travel involved with that. That said, there's plenty of jobs in information security where you don't travel. If you're doing security for like a company, you're there at the same company, helping them secure their infrastructure. Or now, from a military perspective, you never know where you get, get stationed or what's going to happen. So there's travel associated with that. But if you're go thinking about infosec, the travel is variable, but what you decide to do will have a huge impact on that. Yes. So through your work, do you just work for one company, or do you work as more of a freelance agent between companies? So interesting question. When I started in information security, I worked for one company. Um, it was Bellcor, Bell Communications Research. They were kind of like part of Bell Labs that, that helped the baby Bell companies, if you even remember those, like Ameritech. You remember that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, so I, I worked for just w one company at that time. And then after a while, I went to work for another company and then another company. And then I decided I want to make my own company. So I made my own company, and that's where I work now. And I hire people, and they work for me. Yeah. So there's a, just a lot of opportunity. Here's the deal. We need hundreds of thousands of people to do cybersecurity, and we don't have them. Um, it's, it's a big problem. There's just not enough people for whatever reason – I'm not trying to offend you, but young people want to become lawyers or reality TV stars. I, I, I don't understand why. I wouldn't want to be a lawyer. I wouldn't want to be a reality TV star. Um, obviously, you want to become other things, but I ask you to consider becoming a cybersecurity professional because we need so many people. The salaries are crazy good. The opportunities are crazy good. Um, it's amazing to see the inflation of salaries of people who have these skills just going up and up and up and up. And it's fun. It's a lot of fun, too. So... I think this, let's get back to this gentleman, and then, yes, uh, oh, you good? Okay, yes, sir. I was going to say, um, nice shirt, I like that. Thank you. Um, how similar is encryption today to the Indian machine back then, and like, how much harder would you say it is now to, to do Ah, that? great question. How similar is encryption today to what it was in the Enigma machine? The foundational principles are actually very similar. I mean, it's all substitution and transposition. So you're just taking one letter and substituting another letter for it, or transposition. That said, we're doing it with computers now, which, you know, your typical computer runs 2.5 to 3 gigahertz. Have you ever thought about that? 3 gigahertz, that, that might mean nothing to you, but 3 gigahertz means your computer can do 3 billion really simple little operations every second. 3 billion a second. That's pretty amazing. And that's probably the max that we're going to be able to do in a single chip. Do you know why? This is crazy the speed of light. You might think that light is really fast. You're wrong. Light is crazy slow. It's like this whole speed limit on our entire universe. The speed of light is so slow. So if you look at something running at 3 gigahertz, you can only send a signal about that far based on the speed of light. That's how far light can go in a, a third of a nanosecond. That's it, and that's how big our chips are going to be. The reason I'm bringing this up, though, is 3 billion times a second, you can do a transposition or substitution. So today's encryption is way, 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 way faster. And we can add in more rounds, more layers of substitution and transposition because we're doing it with automated computer systems. It's pretty cool. So same principles, same idea, but way faster and more complex. But it's just adding, essentially adding more rotors is what we're doing. But it's all done now with software. Great question. I love that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, if someone were to go into cybersecurity, how, you said you're traveling like down to about 50% yeah. of your work. Would that be for everyone, or could you choose to stay at? Oh, you, yes. So the, the, uh, the lady's question is, my own work was at 80% travel. Now it's down to 50%. You can make choices, but when you're negotiating for your job, I was just talking with a, a friend last week. I was at a hacker conference. I go to hacker conferences a lot. Yeah. And um, he's got a baby coming soon. Uh, he's a young guy. Baby's coming uh, and he's getting a new job. And the job, when it was listed to him, 75% travel. And I said to him, I said, are, are you sure you want to get into that? He's like, I don't. Well, you're about to take the job. Yeah, what should I do? I said, well, you need to talk to them. Like, right away. This was just last week, and I had this conversation with the guy. And get that 75% knocked down and get it in writing. Because otherwise, you're going in with an expectation that's really going to hurt your family. So you kind of have to decide what's good for you. I remember, look, when I first got out of college, I, I was an idiot. Let me start by saying that. I traveled a lot, and I thought this was a really cool thing, that my travel budget was higher than my salary. 
I thought that was awesome. And I was traveling so much, I'm like, do I really need to pay for an apartment? Because I'm always on the road. I could just live in hotels. And I thought this was cool. I liked the travel early on. After about a year of that, I'm like, this sucks. I don't want to travel that much. Right? So you've got to decide early on how much travel you want. Some of you might want to travel a lot. I loved it for my first year in my career. But then after that, tried to bring it down. I was near 100%, down to 80% for many years, now about 50%. You can make it lower. You can make it 0% if you take a job, usually working for a company, inside the company. Other questions? These are great questions. Thank you. Yes, sir? How did Germans get, like, other, like, Germans who were receiving codes, like, how did they uh, transmit the keys for them? How did they transmit the keys? They were actually printed in these books. So they were printed in these books. Now, these books were very valuable to get, and we lost a lot of lives trying to grab those books before we had cracked it. So they're actually, it was a printed book that would say, here's, here's what the key is for this day, here it is for that day, and they had a, a separate book for each month. So that's how they did them. Yep. Yes, sir. So the question is uh, the creation of a replica Enigma machine. How come that guy couldn't recreate one? Um, he really wanted it to be perfect. This guy, Jim Orm is his name, he is obsessed with microscopic detail, and he wanted to make it just, just, just right. He's the guy that repairs them for the National Cryptologic Museum. The guy's amazing and brilliant. So it was because he was so fastidious and didn't want anything in this machine to not be historically accurate. That's why it took him so long. Since then, though, there's a, a, another group of people in Germany that are making replica Enigma machines. Um, they're expensive. They're nice. They're not as super precise as Jim Orms was, but uh, they sell them for $20,000 for a replica. So. Yes, sir? Uh, were the Enigma machines for the Germans, uh, were they like, not complicated enough that, like, say, someone could just pick it up and be able to like transmit for a company, or would it be like, would, I'm sorry, uh, would that Enigma, like decoder, encryptor person be like a one of a kind person? Yeah, so, so the question is, the Enigma machine and its use, um, was that easy, was it trained, um, and would there be like just one person who knew that? Yes, 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 yes. The Enigma machine was really hard to use. It was a pain in the butt to use. And you would have, it was actually operated by two people. There would be two people that use it, and they would carry it around. Oh, and their orders were, if your group is going to get captured, smash your Enigma machine, destroy it. We don't want the Allies to get it. That's what the Germans said. So there would be somebody in charge of the Enigma machine, and if we get captured, you destroy that. Um, in fact, Dr. Tom, uh, the, the, the guy that sold me the Enigma machine, he, uh, one time he was in Germany, maybe three, four years ago, they discovered an Enigma machine at the bottom of a lake. And you could see that a German soldier had taken his rifle and smashed it before throwing it in the lake because it had the dent of the rifle, and then they threw it in the lake. Now, the Americans, at least in the Pacific theater, used a different encryption concept for this. Do you know what that was? Navajo code talkers. This is amazing. So... There's so many stories associated with this. So the Navajo Code Talkers. So the Navajo Native Americans had their own language that was not widely used outside of Navajo circles, and we decided to use that as our cipher. And they came up with all these different words, like um, uh, submarine was whale. So they had all these different words. And different groups and different bases would have a Navajo Code Talker. And they said the same thing to the Navajo Code Talkers. If there's a group of American sailors or soldiers that are about to be captured, kill your Navajo code talker because we can't let that fall into the hands of the enemy, which is, that's a pretty rough job, right? If we're going to get captured, you die. Wow. Wow. But they serve valiantly. I mean, they serve this country so well, the Navajo code talkers. Another really interesting thing. This is very, this is not very widely known. At the end of World War I, the Germans are surveying the mess that their country is. And in the 1920s, they're like, you know, someday we might fight a war with the Americans. And they're probably going to use Native American languages as an encryption cipher. So in the 1920s, Germany sent linguists to live among Native American Indians to learn their language just in case someday there's a war with America. 
they weren't well accepted. I mean, these German linguists show up in your tribe, and they're like, we want to learn your language. And they kind of got shunned after it. But what brilliance. This is a true story. They actually sent German linguists to live with Native Americans just to learn the language. Yeah. Um, so I was like thinking about like the layers of complexity, not only with the Enigma machine. I just want to make sure this is accurate. Like, you'd have to go to decrypt the code. You'd have to go through Morse code yep. to the Enigma machine, yep. back into German, German and yep. then you'd have to no German. <laughs> That's right. Everything he said is right. So, so there's, the, four layers? there's four different layers of this. So the idea is you get Morse code, right, dots and dashes. You have to translate that into letters. You then have to crack the encryption. And now you've got German, so you've got to translate that into English. Yep, those are all the different layers. But there's an important distinction that I want to make here. And it's the difference between encoding and encrypting. Encoding is like Morse code. You take letters and you encode them. There's no key. You just encode them, and then you can decode. And we can automate encoding and decoding trivially, just really simple. It's just like a one-for-one -one substitution. Um, there are software companies who will say their technology encrypts things, and it doesn't. It simply encodes them. And therefore, anybody. So uh, there was this one company I was uh, doing an investigation of. They said that they were encrypting all the data when it's on your phone. All the data is encrypted. And we looked at the data on the phone. It was encoded, not encrypted. There was no key. So there's a difference. When you've got a key that encodes something, and I don't know the key, then I've got to crack it. Then I've got to go through this, uh, this crypt analysis. Yeah. Okay. So, um, why don't we wrap up the Enigma, and we'll, and then um, if there's anything else yeah. outside of this conversation that the kids want to talk about. So, if you want to. Sure. Let me do that. So, um, 